anyone who thinks that slavery, in moral terms, still may have something going for it, has been completely marginalized in our society. Well, what sort of instruction do we get from the Bible on the subject of slavery? The creator of the universe clearly expects us to keep slaves. This is true in the Old Testament. This is true in the New Testament. Jesus clearly expects us to keep slaves. Many Christians imagine that Jesus has repudiated or somehow rescinded all of Old Testament law. This is untrue. I can assure you that the the ecclesiastics who were burning heretics for centuries in Europe had read all of the New Testament. But on the subject of slavery, 1 Timothy 6, New Testament, admonishes slaves to serve their masters well. Serve your, serve your believing masters all the better and they thereby partake in their virtue. So if we think this book was written by the creator of the universe, or if we think this book is somehow, even if written by men, unsurpassed and unsurpassable in moral terms, we should own other human beings and make them work for us. The only, guy, the only restraint that God urges upon us on this subject is not to beat them so badly that we knock out their eyes or their teeth. But we can surely beat them. They're slaves, after all. We, we can beat it. We should beat our children, incidentally. Proverbs, Proverbs 23, says, Do not withhold correction from the child. If you beat him with a rod, he will not die. If you beat him with a rod, you will save his soul from hell. Now, I think it should go without saying that any person in 21st century America who's beating his kids with a rod is a bad parent. But if you believe this is the best book on the planet in moral terms, that's the only kind of parent you should be. So there, there's a basic problem here. If we hold these books aside from the rest of the human conversation, make them immune to criticism, if they are uniquely wise, then we are at, at the mercy of their contents. And the problem is exquisitely acute in the Muslim world now, because there really are doctrines in mainstream Islam that are incompatible with civil society, specifically the doctrines of martyrdom and jihad. I mean, th these are deal breakers. There is no possible future in which aspiring martyrs are going to make good neighbors for us. <laughs> now, if, if you think, and being moderates, you're very likely to think this, if you think that Muslim violence is really just a matter of politics, if you think it's the product of the history of oppression and the lack of economic opportunity, you should ask yourselves why we don't see Tibetan Buddhist suicide bombers. The Tibetans have suffered an occupation every bit as brutal and far more cynical than any occupation that has been visited upon the Muslim world. Many people believe that 1.2, 1.3 million Tibetans have died as a result of the Chinese occupation. We don't see throngs of Tibetans calling for the deaths of, Chi of Chinese non-combatants. We don't see Tibetan Buddhist suicide bombers blowing up Chinese children in their schools. What we do see are Tibetan monks and nuns who have spent decades in Chinese prisons being tortured, who come out and say things like, my greatest fear while in prison was that the pain of torture would cause me to lose the strength of my compassion, and I would start to hate my torturers. Now, find me a Muslim who, after decades of being tortured with an electric cattle prod in an Israeli jail, comes out 
speaking that way. And I will eat my book. I'm serious. It is unthinkable, given what Muslims believe. Now, let me be very clear about this. I am not talking about an ethnicity. I'm not talking about Arabs. I'm talking about the logical entailments of the doctrine of Islam. I'm talking about John Walker Lind, the white guy from Marin who went to fight with the Taliban. Now, we may question the wisdom and the desirability of the Buddhist response, the, this emphasis on compassion. Now, I'm absolutely open to argument on this subject. And if you read my book, you'll discover I'm not a pacifist. But what I'm not open to argument on is this taboo that prevents us from noticing the difference between a doctrine of compassion and a doctrine of jihad. The truth is, in the Muslim world, we even see people who haven't suffered much of anything willing to spend their lives trying to figure out how to kill as many non-combatants as possible. You know, Osama bin Laden is really the, the reductio ad absurdum of any argument that suggests that you need to be insane or poor or the victim of oppression to take up jihad. So this is an extraordinary circumstance we're in. We, we have certain religious beliefs leading to the most nihilistic violence. But what, what could be more nihilistic than blowing yourself up in a crowd of children and having your mother approve of it? This is the situation we're in. Now, I really want to nail this down because many of you are, are very likely still to believe, no, 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 Islam is a religion of peace. These are, these are economic and political issues. This is a result of the misadventures of, of American foreign policy. America has a tremendous amount to apologize for in the world. There is no doubt. But this is a separate issue. Yes, they're related, but this is a separate issue. There is no possibility that we will ever have a problem with Jane suicide bombers. Insofar as a Jane becomes more and more religious, even more and more deranged by his religious dogmas, he will become less and less violent. The doctrine of Jainism is a, is a doctrine of total pacifism. Jains drink every sip of water, observant Jains drink every sip of water through cheesecloth so that they won't sm swallow a bug. They, they sweep the, the path upon which they walk so that they won't step on ants. They can scarcely figure out how to live in this world. They're so nonviolent. So if you don't think religion is the difference that makes a difference, you have to explain the Jains.